Hello, and welcome to part six in our study on the biblical view of heaven. In this lesson, we are going to look at what are people doing in heaven now. Last lesson, we looked at who's there, who's not there, what's there, and what is not there. Now we're going to look at what are the people doing in heaven now. Now to start with, there's some qualifiers. God doesn't tell us everything about what people are doing right now, but he does give us an idea of some things. And again, I, I've said this before and I repeat it now, this study is not exhaustive uh, by any means. I hope it gives you good insight, but uh, we're doing the best that we can here to pull out what God does tell us. But bottom line is God does not tell us everything. He gives us what we need to know and certainly what will encourage our hearts. So let's look at, we sort of have a list here now of what people are doing that are in heaven right now. Number one, they're worshiping God. They're worshiping God. Revelation 7, 9 through 12. And after these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number. Here again, as we talk about these things, I've, I've said it before, if, if you have to pause the video, just, you know, you hear something that strikes you, just stop it. A lot of this, you do, we're talking about heaven. You've got to just sit back and you've got to think about it. You've almost got to close your eyes and say, Lord, show me things here. Show me. This is not just simple education. You know, words fill in a blank. You've got to let the Holy Spirit speak to you. You've got to let God talk to your heart to really get the magnitude of what's going on. Here's a statement right there. Look, I behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. So you're looking at a massive, massive, massive crowd of people here. People that have come from all over the world. All different kinds of people from all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. And a multitude that nobody could number. It's that big. And now they are, they're standing before God. It says, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So here's this great multitude of people that have been redeemed from all over the world, all different kinds of people, dressed in their robes, standing before God, and praising God for their salvation. Praising God for their salvation. And he continues on. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders, and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and they worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. We looked in our last lesson when it talked about the angels around about the throne. As it said, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. Over a hundred million angels. A hundred million angels then add thousands and thousands. And then add to that group that's not enough. A multitude of people that can't even be numbered from all over the world, all crying out with their voice, worshiping and praising God. What an awesome, awesome picture. You've got to just stop and say, Lord, let me just visualize a bit of what this could be like. Uh, you can't just read it. You have to think about it. You have to meditate on something like this. You have to just sit back, be quiet, and say, Lord, let this sink in of what's going on in heaven and what I will be a part of when I go to heaven. What I will be a part of when I go to heaven. And doesn't this sound marvelous? Doesn't this sound glorious? Remember, Satan gets into our minds sometimes and he goes, oh, you know, you're just going to be worshiping God all the time. Boy, what a drudgery that's going to be. That's going to be boring. That's going to be tedious. That, does this sound boring? Does this sound tedious? I mean, infinitesimally smaller. Think of a large crowd that's cheering for their football team. When they all rise up and they're cheering and they're chanting and they're just like that. Do they look bored? 
Do they look like they're suffering or they're in pain? They're happy. They're in their glory if their team's winning. And, and I mean, that's just a tiny picture. They're worshiping God. They're not being forced. They haven't been whipped into submission, saying, get over here now. It's time to worship God. Oh, we worshiped him yesterday. We've got to do this again today. No, they are excited beyond measure. They are filled with joy and excitement because they now see God for who he really is. Remember, they're in heaven. All the restraints and the limitations of our sin nature are gone. They're not being forced. God isn't forcing them to do anything. If he was going to force people to do something, he would have just he would have never allowed sin. He would have just forced them to love him. He would have just forced people to obey them. God is some not earthly king that, you know, his mind has gone wacky thinking that he's something that he's not and it's just going to force his people to bow down and worship him. Bow down and worship me or you'll die. That's not God. God is love. God is love and he showed his love towards us by dying on the cross to pay the price for our sins so that we could trust in him and we could come to heaven. And a God that is love knows what real love is. And he has people before him worshiping him, not because he made them worship him, because they want to worship him. Why? Because he is worthy of worship. He's God. He's absolute perfection and holiness and righteousness. None of this is forced. It's all done willingly and with great joy. Okay, little little side note there, but... Uh, Revelation, I'll, I'll skip down a few. Revelation 19, 5 through 7. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, that's reverence him, have respect for him. That's what that word there means. Both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God omnipotent reigns. Our God who is holy and righteous and just. He's the one that's in charge. Don't we long for something like that today? To have someone who is righteous and just and honest ruling in our nation? Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice throughout the world? That those that are presidents and prime ministers and, and, and leaders of countries and those in senates and congress and parliaments and whatever it might be, that they were holy people, they were righteous people, they were just people, they were sincere people, they were loving and caring people. Wouldn't that be refreshing? Refreshing is not even close to the right word. This is why people are rejoicing. Not because of God who is forcing them, pushing them down like a, like a bug under his thumb. But the God who truly is righteous and just and holy. And stands against sin and stands against evil. And judges it and puts it away forever. That he's the one on the throne. Not some evil d demonic force. Not some hideous dictator is on the throne that we have to suffer with throughout eternity. No, a righteous, holy, loving God. Amen? Preach it, brother. I'm getting ready to preach now. That's powerful stuff. Think about it. Man. I mean, just man. I get annoyed sometimes because I know how Satan wants to get in there and make all these glorious things look like how they're horrible. That's what the devil does. The second thing that they're doing, and it goes right along with this, is they're serving God. They're serving God. Now, once you look at that, go, oh, here we go. We got to worship them. Now we got to serve them. Boy, this is going to be misery. This is going to be horrible. When do I get around to having some fun in heaven? I got to be serving God all the time. Revelation 22 3. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Revelation 7.15 Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Now, again, I put the same emphasis here. This is not service out of compulsion. This is not a dictator cracking the whip 
bow down before me, serve me, jump at my beck and call kind of a thing. No. These are people who know God, who love God because of who he is, not just simply because of what he's done for them, that has redeemed them and saved them and given them an eternity in paradise. Thank you very much. Right there's enough reason right there. But they see who he is, his holiness and his purity, and they love him. Put it down on a human level. And look at, look at a loving mother and a loving wife who ministers to her family, who serves her family, not out of compulsion, but out of love. Because she loves her family. She wants to do good for them. Look at a loving father who goes to work every day to earn a living because he loves his family and he wants to provide for them. He wants the best for them. They serve out of a heart of gratitude and love and it brings them joy. I think of, you know, I'm from an Italian family and I think of my grandmother and stuff. When she cooked, <laughs> could, could that woman cook? Man, could she, when you think of an, uh, an Italian grandmother who knows how to cook, <clears throat> there's my grandmother. But my point is, when you went into my grandmother's house, she didn't come over and say hello. I can still picture my grandmother now, and I walk through the door, she gets up off the sofa in the living room. And it was the living room, it was the kitchen, and it was where you came in. She didn't come over <clears throat> and put her arms around me and say, Frenine, how nice to see you today. No, 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 no. She didn't do that. She got up from the sofa, and she went right to the refrigerator. She just went to the refrigerator, opened the door, and out started coming the food. And she started putting it on the table. Because that was her way of showing love. That was her way of serving. When you ate her cooking and you fed yourself and you were full, she was happy. She was she didn't go, oh gee, you know, here's my here's my grandson, here's the things. I gotta get up. I gotta cook. I gotta this. I got she was like, yes. And this is just a small example. She was happy when she made other people happy through her cooking and through them eating. And I can still remember, you'd get done eating and you're full and she'd go, have, have some more. Have some more. Grandma, come on. <laughs> I'm bursting over here. What, you didn't like it? You didn't... <laughs> What's the matter? What, she then you talk to my father in Italian. What, he doesn't like it? Ma, he likes it. He, he's full. You know, he had 22 plates. Come on. Get... That's the way she, that was her joy. That was her joy. She gave her pleasure. When we're serving God, it's not out of compulsion. It's out of joy because we love him. We're grateful to him. We're thankful to him. And we want to serve him. We look for ways to serve him. It's not drudgery. We do it rejoicingly. So we're going to worship God. We're going to serve God. We're going to fellowship with God. Fellowshipping, the word fellowship means to have things in common. To do things together. Scripture teaches us that throughout eternity, when the new in the new heavens and the new Jerusalem comes down, and the new Jerusalem comes down and places itself on earth, and we're on earth and we're in the new Jerusalem, that God is going to dwell in the new Jerusalem. It's not going to be a relationship like now we're here and God is way, way off in heaven. And we are believing by faith. We don't see face to face. We believe by faith. Not that way through eternity. We're going to be here. We're going to be in our new glorified bodies. And God is going to be right in the new Jerusalem. That's where he is going to reside. That's where he is going to dwell. We are going to be able to see him on a continuous basis. We will be able to talk with him. Just like Adam and Eve did before they fell. Remember they're in the garden. And it's like God walked in the cool of the garden and talked with them. He had conversations with them. He fellowshiped with them. They had things in common. They had things they could talk about. We're now in heaven. Our sin nature is gone. All the evil and everything else is gone. We are now holy and righteous. We are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We have things to talk about with God. Think about that. Hit the pause button and think about that. We'll be able to have conversations with God and with Jesus. We're going to fellowship with him. 1 John 1, 3. 
That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. As we fellowship together as Christians, we have fellowship with each other now. We know as Christians, we have fellowship. We have things in common. We have Jesus in common. We have God in common. We have salvation in common. And we have a degree of fellowship here, even in our sinful bodies. We're going to have not only that kind of fellowship, perfect fellowship <clears throat> when we're in heaven, because we won't have the restrictions of sin. And we're going to have fellowship with each other, and as it says here, with the Father and with Jesus Christ. Talk about having a dinner over at your house that Jesus has made for you. Think how nice it is to say, hey, want to invite Jesus over? Let's have Jesus over. Have dinner. There'll be no asking who's going to say grace. Jeez, is that even right? I'm sorry, I don't know. We're going to fellowship with God. We're going to absolutely have fellowship with Him. 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. I'm looking forward to fellowshipping, not only with my brothers and sisters in Christ, but with Jesus himself and with my Heavenly Father. Think of the love of God Almighty himself. <clears throat> God Almighty himself, who created the heavens and the earth, who created the universe, who creates all that existed, he is willing to fellowship with you and with me. That is awesome. That is mind-boggling. Mind-boggling that we can fellowship with God. Unbelievable. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Number four, we're learning. We are learning. And the people in heaven now are doing these things now. I, I know I'm emphasizing the future. For you and me, it's future. We're still here on earth. But for those that are there in heaven now, they're worshiping God, they're serving God, they're fellowshipping with God, they're learning. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, when we go to be with the Lord. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. When we step into heaven, we're going to learn. We're going to see things that we don't see now. We're going to understand things that we don't understand now. And I've got to believe we're going to be spending eternity with God. <clears throat> I don't think we'll ever get to a point where we completely understand God. But there are so many things that we don't know. God has told us, I, I haven't even begun to tell you what's, what's, what's in store for you in heaven because you couldn't comprehend it. Your mind couldn't take it. You wouldn't understand it. So we're going to spend eternity, we're going to be learning new things, we're going to be discovering new things, we're going to be doing things that we talked about some of the things that, that we're doing. I think God's going to have new and greater things for us to do. We have no idea what God has in store down the road. I mean, we're talking eternity, so 10,000 years from now, God may say, hey, guess what I'm going to be doing? Bop, 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 and I want you to be a part of this. This is what I want you to do, you to do, you to do. This is what I need to show you this, I need to show you. We're spending eternity. Get away from this idea that heaven is boring, and we're just sitting on a cloud playing that same old song on a harp. <laughs> it's just, forget about it. Just forget about it. It's that's not what it is. Heaven is going to be exciting. Worshipping, serving, fellowshipping, learning, rejoicing. Rejoicing. I'm going to give you five. Okay, rejoicing. Psalm 16, 11. In your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You think the devil describes heaven like this? Absolutely not. Dead, boring, and dry. That's the devil's description. God's description, fullness of joy. Not just joy, fullness of joy. At your right hand, pleasures. Joy, pleasures, for how long? I mean, here on earth, you get joy and you get pleasures. Right away, you start worrying about when's it going to end? When, when's it going to end? This is too good to be true. Something's going to happen. Something's going to go wrong. This can't keep going on this way. This is just way too nice. Not in heaven. 
We've got the fullness of joy and pleasures at our right hand forevermore, for eternity. Psalm 68, 3 through 4. I want to go now. I mean, come on. Man. Psalm 68, 3 through 4. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God and let them rejoice exceedingly exceedingly joy pleasures gladness rejoicing exceedingly then he says sing to God sing praises to his name extol him who rides on the clouds and rejoice before him we're going to be singing we're going to be singing to God we're going to be praising God so we're rejoicing we have fullness of joy we have pleasures forevermore we have gladness rejoicing again, rejoicing exceedingly, and we're singing to God, we're singing praises to Him, praise to His name, singing, glorifying Him for who He is and what He is. Luke 15, 7. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. So is this worth, is, earth is still here, and if we're in heaven before them, and their soul's getting saved, we're going to be rejoicing in heaven that, hey, here's another soul got saved. Here's another person delivered from hell, and they're coming to spend eternity where we are. Because we know how magnificent this is. And we know how horrible hell is. So every soul, one soul gets saved. There's rejoicing in heaven. There's gladness. We're going to have it all. So we're worshiping, we're serving, we're fellowshipping, we're learning, we're rejoicing, we're singing. Those are just six things that we're doing. And remember that all of these things that they're doing now in heaven, they're doing without a sin nature. Without a sin nature. They're doing it in perfect purity and with full joy. So we can be sure that heaven is wonderful beyond our imagination beyond our imagination paul paul talks about rejoicing in heaven he says in philippians 1:21 for me to live is christ and to die is gain to die is gain that word gain there means to get more to acquire more when i go to heaven Paul's saying, when I go to heaven, I'm going to get more. I'm going to get more Christ. I'm going to get more knowledge. I'm going to get more service. I'm going to worship him more. I'm going to get more joy. I'm going to have more excitement. I'm going to be singing my praises to God. I'm just going to get more of God. He said in chapter 1, verse 23, For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to be with Christ, which is far better. Being in heaven is far better. And remember, <clears throat> Paul spoke from experience. God took him to heaven. God gave him a glimpse of what heaven was like. Remember, he took him up there, but he said, these are words that are inexpressible. Inexpressible. He wouldn't let him talk about it. It was so magnificent that Paul said, I could just get puffed up on myself by having the sheer privilege of seeing what's there. So Paul was speaking from experience. And that's why he says in Romans 8:18, 8, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us every hard thing and here's where you should take encouragement every hard thing every suffering that we're going through in this world and we go through them god told us that we will in this world you will have tribulation he says i know what we're going through in this world and i've seen what the other what heaven is like and i'm telling you they're not worthy to be compared the word worthy means to have equal weight equal weight and here's our sufferings, and here's the glory of heaven. Nah, they're not equal. And as far as I can go, here's our sufferings, if you're comparing it, and here's the glory of God in heaven. 
they're not equal to even try to compare them. Heaven is so much better. So what we have to go through here, what we are going through here, why we're still in this sinful world and still in this sinful body, rejoice. Rejoice if you're a Christian, a true Christian, because there are far, far, far better days ahead. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Let's move on to the next category. Will we know each other in heaven? Will we know each other in heaven? This question usually comes up because we had this idea of people going to heaven and their, and, their, and their spirit goes to heaven, body goes in the grave, the spirit goes to heaven, and the somehow with this disembodied spirits, uh, all memory is gone, we all look alike, we, all, we won't know each other um, because we all look the same and our memories have been wiped and all of these things. So. Uh, so they assume that, that there's no distinction. It's not that we know it. We, we just, it's something we assume. We assume all angels look alike. So we'll all look alike when we're, because what does the spirit look like? We don't know. We don't know what our spirit looks like. So, but to answer this, if you think about angels all looking alike, we know that Michael and Gabriel don't look alike. They're distinct. They're two separate ones. There's nothing that tells us that all angels look alike. There's nothing that says we can't distinguish one angel from another. There's nothing in Scripture that says we won't, that we will all look alike. We certainly can f figure that out from after the resurrection because God is giving us a new body. We're not all going to be clones. There's nothing to indicate that we're going to be a clone, that we're all going to look the same, we're all going to be twins. If that was going to be the case, then why wouldn't God just immediately give us our heavenly bodies and why resurrect our bodies that are in the ground? It's to maintain that distinctiveness. You mean I'm going to look like I look now in heaven? Yeah. With no imperfection. With no imperfections. Believe me. Don't get nervous. Believe me. You will love your resurrected body. Minimum, we know, all imperfections will be gone. No sickness, no deformities, no, no, all gone, all gone. And we're not going to evaluate ourselves like we evaluate here on earth. You know, what's pretty, what's not pretty, what's handsome, what's not handsome. Ooh, I wish I had that body. Ooh, I, had, I wish I had that. Oh, look at that. No. Gone, gone. We're not going to evaluate things like that. We're going to have glorified bodies. All of these different things that we think physically or sexually or something, gone. That's a, we're in a whole new realm of being. So we're going to have glorified bodies that are perfect bodies that we are going to be totally happy with. But I believe there will be distinctions. We will know each other. I believe that we will. Scripture does not indicate that we have a memory wipe. You know, that God takes our memories, hit delete, and we just wipe it clean. So... I, now, script, there's no scripture that says, Thou shalt retain your memory. Thou shalt retain your individual looks. But I think that there's enough in scripture that shows us that that is the truth. Let me give you eight reasons why. Eight. Eight. I'll do them first. I'll do them quickly. Yeah, I said it again. We'll do it quickly. Number one, here's why I think that we will know each other in heaven. It will know who we are. One, Christ's transfiguration. I'm not going to read the verses. Let me just, it's Matthew 17, 1 through 4. But we know at the transfiguration, Moses appeared there and Elijah appeared there and appeared along with Jesus Christ. They retained their identities and they've been having a long time. Moses was there a long time. Elijah was there a long time. And they, re and they retained their distinction. And the, two, and the three people that were there, they knew who Moses was and who Elijah was. Now, Scripture doesn't say how they knew him. I mean, maybe Christ introduced them. This is Moses. This is Elijah. Or they might have said, hi, James. Hi, Peter. I'm Moses. I'm Elijah. Fine. But they still were distinctive. They knew who, who Moses was and who Elijah was. They remained their, kept their distinction. Number two, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Matthew 8, verse 11. And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. 
So what's the implication here? People, there's a distinction. There's still an Abraham. There's still an Isaac. There's still a Jacob. Abraham knows who Isaac is. Isaac knows who Jacob is. Jacob knows who Abraham is. The, Abraham knows his grandchildren. The grandchildren knows the grandfather. We're going to be enjoying company with his sons and his grandsons. So there's a distinction there. You see what I'm saying? We're not just, we're not all sitting down at the table and we have to go, we won't even ask, who are you? What? <laughs> if everybody's looking the same, because we'll be, we'll be so used to that. So they have their distinctions. Three, Mary recognized the resurrected Jesus. Now, she didn't instantly recognize him. She was all emotional. She saw that Jesus wasn't there. It says when she saw him standing there, whether his back was to her or whatever, she assumed it was the gardener. Uh, but eventually, when Jesus spoke to her, he just said a word, Mary, she recognized the voice. Then she looked at him and went, whoa. I mean, her head might have been down all that time. It's, you know, where have you taken my Lord? Where is he? These things we don't know, but we know when he spoke her name, she looked at him and she recognized him. So he retained. He's the best example. Here he is in his resurrected body, and he retained his distinctiveness. Mary knew who he was. Fourth, the apostles recognized him. Again, I won't read it, but John 20, verses 18 through 20, when he appeared to them, when they were locked in the room, because they were so afraid, and Jesus appeared to them. At first, they recognized him, but they thought he was a ghost. They didn't understand resurrection like you and I understand the resurrection of Jesus today. They're like, whoa, look at this. We know Jesus was dead, and now he's standing in front of us. This must be a ghost. But they recognized who it was. And then he explains to him who he is. He's, you know, it's me. It's physical. Touch my hands. Touch my side. They recognized him. That's my point. He, he retained his individual identity. Number five, the scripture says that Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, appeared to over 500 people. Now, if he was not recognizable, if people didn't know who he was, if he just looked like a clone, those 500 people wouldn't have known who they were looking at. They would have gone, well, we, we don't know that's Jesus. You're telling us it's Jesus. What do we know from, what do we, he doesn't look anything like Jesus. No. Again, he retained his individuality. Jesus was recognizable to over 500 people after his resurrection. Number six, the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man and Lazarus, you know that story, Luke 16, 23 through 24. And being in torment in Hades, the rich man, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham. And he saw Lazarus. Okay, so he sees two individuals. But it says, then he cried and he said, Father Abraham. He knew who he was. He knew who he was. Have mercy on me and send Lazarus. He knew Abraham wasn't Lazarus. Again, they re he retained his distinction. The rich man knew Abraham. He knew Lazarus. And he says to him, have him dip his finger in the water, cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And then he says to him, you know the story, he says, send Lazarus back to tell my family, to tell my brothers that this place is real. I don't want him to come here. What do we glean from that? In this context, he remembered his brothers. He didn't forget his brothers, and he's already died. His spirit is in Hades. He's in hell. The great gulf between the two. He knows Abraham. He knows Lazarus. He knows who he is. And he remembers his family back on earth. So there's no memory sweep. We retain our memories, and we are retaining our individualities. Number seven, the judgment seat of Christ. We talked about this before, I think, in the last message. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Matthew 12.36 says that we will give an account for every idle word that we speak. I'm not happy with that verse. I don't, I'm not looking forward to that. But we're going to do it. What does that imply here, though, in this context? We're going to have to remember. We're going to know who we are. We're not going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and go, who are you talking about? I, 
I don't have a clue what you're talking about, Lord. I have to give an account for my life as a Christian? That's what the judgment seat is for. I don't know who you're talking about. I like God amnesia. I just... Fred? Fred who? I, I, I can't help you here. No, I'm going to know who Fred Tarsitano is. And I'm going to be, I'm going to have to have a better memory than I have now to be able to give an account of myself. So we have our individuality. We have our memories. We will give an account of our lives. And number eight, look at the order of the resurrection. The order of the resurrection. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. <clears throat> but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, according to those who have fallen asleep. He's talking about those who are alive and those that have already died. And then he's talking about the rapture here, the resurrection. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Then down at the last verse, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. So they were, Jesus was saying there's a resurrection coming. The rapture is going to happen. I'm going to pull you off this planet. But don't get nervous or concerned about those that have already died. There's memory while they're here on earth. I'm going to call them out of the grave first. They're coming out first. And then after I call them out, I'm calling you up. And you're going to be there. Comfort yourself with this. What is he saying? There's going to be a great reunion in heaven. Well, you can't have a, a reunion without a memory and without the distinction of who's what. He's saying those who have died in Christ, your loved ones who have died in Christ, you're going to meet them again. You're going to see them again. You're going to be with them again. You're going to know them. You're going to remember them. They're going to remember you. There's going to be great rejoicing in heaven. Otherwise, what comfort is there? What are you worried about? If there's no memory of anyone else, if there's no distinction, what do you have to be comforted about? Just uh, God's taking me. Thank you. No. We have the memories, we have the retention. So what have we seen here? Moses and Elijah retained their personal identities. Mary recognized the resurrected Jesus. The apostles recognized the resurrected Jesus. Over 500 people recognized the resurrected Jesus. The rich man knew who Abraham was, who Lazarus was. He remembered who he was, and he remembered his family that were back on earth. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob retained their personal identities. The judgment seat, we're going to have to retain our identity uh, and our memories, I should say, both, of what we did on heaven. God told us before that our knowledge in heaven will increase. Remember we talked about last time what we're going to be doing in heaven? One of the things is we're going to be learning. <clears throat> so our increase is going to our increase. Our knowledge is going to increase. It's not going to decrease. And then lastly, Paul comforted the Christians saying, don't worry about those who have got, died before. You're going to be reunited with them, which entails personal identity and a memory. So there we've got it. I believe that we will in heaven know each other and will retain our memories in heaven. All right. Is that good? Two categories we handled this time. Got it done in pretty good time. I trust that you're uh, going through all the series here. That six parts. We're just about halfway done if I stay on target. And thank you for hanging in there. We've got about six more, maybe seven more to go. And we should be finished. But I'm enjoying this. And I, I just I pray that you are too. It's really, really, really exciting. Every time I go over this, uh, and even as I'm preaching this, I just get more and more and more excited about heaven. Thank you for watching. Lord bless you.